curiosity, hope, and wonder all have a great deal to do with imagination. And imagination is important because it enriches our lives. It enriches our individual lives, and I believe it enriches our collective life because it enables us to see things differently. Now, I'm also going to suggest, if you've heard, that um, boredom has something to do with imagination. And I first came to this conclusion 15 years ago after I finished a study looking at the influence of television on children's story writing. I read about 400 stories um, written by children in five different schools, children aged between 10 and 12, and I studied 36 of them in some detail. And what I found was that, um, that yes, I did see ideas that they'd taken from the screen in their stories, but what was the principal source of inspiration in their stories was their own direct personal experience. And, um, and what I also found was that um, the degree of imaginativeness in their stories could be seen along a spectrum. So at one end, there was imitative imagination, and at the other end, there was transformative imagination. And the, the, they seemed to be able to transform their own personal direct experience into something new much more readily than anything they took from the screen. And this was also borne out by other people who've researched the influence of television on children's imagination. So one way of looking at this, I decided, was that if the imagination is captured, then we're likely to want to copy it or imitate it in what we do. But if our imagination is fired, that's a different thing. And then we will transform what we've experienced, whether in real life or from the screen, and make it into something new. And as I said, that I think that's more likely to happen with our own personal direct experience, our first-hand experience, rather than second-hand things from the screen. Now, 15 years ago is a long time in um, the media world, and the media have changed out of all recognition in that time. And we now have digital media, which are both mobile and interactive. And as we've already heard, they're an amazingly, stunningly powerful thing, both for communicating information and ideas and opinions, and also give us all sorts of new opportunities for being creative. But I'd like to voice a note of caution, because I think we need to learn to use these fantastically powerful um, media mindfully, purposefully, and deliberately as tools, and not use them simply to fill time or to kill time. Because we actually need to welcome moments of boredom, moments of downtime when our minds are disengaged and we might fear feeling bored, and not in those moments automatically reach for our fantastic digital devices. Um, because the thing is that boredom offers us all sorts of opportunities. It offers us the opportunity to stand and stare, to watch the world go by, to watch, to observe our fellow human beings, our built environment, the natural world. These moments allow us to reflect on our experience and to daydream and to get up out of our chairs and away from that little space that we're looking at on a screen and go outside and move around and feel the elements and use all our senses, not just our sight and our hearing. And these moments allow us time to be creative. Now, I came on the train today and all around me, people were using their digital devices and um, Interestingly, only a few weeks ago, a survey was published that showed that um, digital device users um, 
64% of them, or 64% of the time rather, are using at least two devices at once. And 52% of the people surveyed said if they found themselves at a loose end, they'd prefer to check their phone than to sit and think. And amongst people aged 18 to 30, that rose to 62%. Now, on the train, I love looking out of the window. I love watching the countryside go past, which I don't see very often. I love watching the countryside gradually change into the city. And there are all sorts of sights that one can see from a railway track that one can't see anywhere else. All the backs of buildings that we don't normally see, all those gardens. It's wonderful. But my favorite sight is, the, is seeing a buddleia growing out of a derelict building. How many people have seen buddleia plants waving from an unused factory out of the roof? I think it's extraordinary. It, this kind of thing fills me with a sense of wonder. And one, uh, having a sense of wonder is very important for our sense of well-being. So train journeys, of course, aren't the only times when we find ourselves at a loose end, perhaps, when we have some empty time with nothing much to do. We have these times when we're waiting in the dentist's waiting room or walking down the street or lying in bed at the beginning or end of the day, perhaps, um, half awake. And all these times are great opportunities to wonder about life, to wonder at life, to commune with ourselves rather than turning outwards and projecting an image onto the public outside world. But if, when we have nothing to do in these odd moments, we seize our mobile device to text or to tweet or to uh, try out a new app, or to surf the internet, or play games, we're taken away from ourselves, out, out of ourselves, and we're cut off from our immediate surroundings. And if at home we find ourselves at a loose end for longer periods, for hours, we might well turn on a television or watch a DVD because that's often relaxing. And there's nothing wrong with that. We all do need to relax. But the thing is that if we have hours of spare time, um, then those, that time is time that we can be using our hands, our heart, or our head to get really stuck into something that takes our interest, that really engages us, that we can get immersed in and engrossed in. And when we are immersed in something that really takes our interest and we enjoy, we get a sense of flow that sense that we lose track of time passing, we forget about ourselves and we forget about our worries and everything else and just enjoy being in the moment. And that sense of flow is also very important for our sense of well-being. Now, we're living at a time of many threats to personal well-being and threats to environmental well-being. And if the world is to change for the better, we need to use all our powers of imaginative and creative thinking. And I'd like to give you three examples now of creative thinking that have brought about the kind of innovation that our best hope for a better future rests on. The first one of these is agricultural. It's permaculture, which has been defined in various ways, but one definition is the deliberate design of cultivated ecosystems that have the diversity, stability, and resilience of natural ecosystems, creating abundance. And you can see here a, a, an area in China where permaculture has been applied, and I think you can see how it's been transformed from a barren place into a green, flourishing, productive place. You can see in uh, Mexico here, where by using a particular form of natural irrigation, the land has become productive. And nearer to home in um, Britain, uh, a community uh, permaculture project in Blackburn in Lancashire. The second uh, example is technological. 
And it's a bike that's made entirely out of recycled materials. In fact, almost all cardboard by Ishar Gafni, um, a self-taught Israeli inventor and cycling enthusiast who spent six years developing a bike made out of recycled cardboard. It has no metal parts, it needs no maintenance, it can't get punctures, and when it goes into production, we'll be able to buy it for about £12.50. <laughs> so can you imagine how that could transform transport the world over? And the third uh, example is social. It's the transition movement. Now, tra the transition philosophy is a brainchild of Rob Hopkins, who it, um, began to think about these things when he was working in Kinsale in Ireland and then further developed them in uh, Totnes in Devon. And in fact, over the last six years or so, um, transition towns have popped up all over the UK, and in fact, there's a, an online transition town network that has a global spread. And transition <coughs> offers a positive vision for building local resilience in the face of environmental and economic crisis. It sees the potential for an extraordinary economic, cultural, and, social, and spiritual renaissance simply through revitalizing the local particularly local food production, but also the production of local building materials and the development of local culture and social interdependence through relying much less on stuff and much more on supportive and inspiring social connectedness and having fun in the process. So the kind of thing that transition towns um, organize, for instance, are reskilling events where people teach each other old skills such as knitting and um, darning and compost making and food preservation and some transition towns have developed their own currency where locally produced goods can be traded. Brixton is one of them, Bristol is another, right, which have their own pounds. So um, all these uh, innovations um, have required a great deal of um, think, wondering, wondering what if, how, what, what would happen if we did this, wondering how we could do that, imagining new possibilities and trying out different ideas. The essence of imagination and creativity of any kind is making new connections between observations, questions, and knowledge. And we can set our minds to being creative by sitting down and trying to work something out, but often creative and imaginative thoughts take us by surprise when we're not, expect we're not really thinking about anything in particular in the gaps and pauses in life. And I think Winnie the Pooh actually has something to, to offer us here. Poetry and hums aren't things which you get. They're things which get you. And all you can do is go where they can find you. And what I'm saying is that creative thoughts won't find us while our attention is distracted by texts and tweets and emails and our minds are constrained within the narrow confines of a computer game. We can't think deeply or mull over ideas while we're sending off quick fire responses in 140 characters or zapping our way to the next level. Don't get me wrong, social networking, surfing the web and gaming are perfectly good activities if we enter into them deliberately and purposefully. But what I'm saying is that these things shouldn't be our default activity, our defense against boredom. Someone who's come to realize this full well is the novelist Neil Gaiman. He said that constant social networking makes boredom impossible. And he should know, he's got 1.8 million Twitter followers, half a million Facebook friends, 
one and a half million readers of his blog. But in, the, in, in June this year, in an interview with the Guardian newspaper, he said, the best way to come up with new ideas is to get really bored and announced that he was going to give himself a six-month sabbatical from electronic connectedness. So we can't all think up radical new ideas or write novels or paint wonderful pictures or compose or direct films or design buildings, but we all do have the potential to be creative because it's part of what makes us human. So we can all learn the pleasure and satisfaction we can get from developing our creativity and from developing our sense of wonder, as well as from quiet and reflection and observation. But only if we put aside our digital devices during free time and let our minds wander.